Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the 10th episode of the Insights on Digital Financial Services during COVID-19 webinar series organized by the ITU. We hope that you, your family, your friends, and your colleagues are all keeping healthy and safe. My name is Bilal Jamosi. I'm the Chief of the Study Groups Department at the Telecommunication Standardization Bureau of the ITU. And it's a great privilege for me to introduce today's webinar on interoperability and resiliency requirements for digital payment systems. Before I introduce the panelists, I'll provide some general information concerning the logistics of today's webinar. All the presentations will be available after the webinar on the website of the event. I am pleased to inform you that we have captioning in French uh, for the webinar today. All questions from participants will be taken at the end of all presentations during the Q&A session. Participants can submit their questions by typing in the Q&A window uh, at the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. When submitting a question through the Q&A window, I invite participants to type first the name of the panelist to whom the question is addressed, followed by the question. If the question is addressed to all the panelists, please simply type your question. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the webinar webpage later this week. Let me introduce our panelists. Uh, the speakers will take the floor in the following order. Ms. Dorothy Delort from the World Bank Group, followed by Mr. Kevin, Kevin Butler, University of Florida, Mr. Anant Notial, GSMA, Mr. Salah Khan from UPU, uh, Mr. Abhinav Pratap Singh from uh, Indian Post. In this episode, we will examine the interoperability issues and resiliency requirements for digital payment systems in emerging economies and the impact during COVID-19. Interoperability is deemed to be one of the crucial characteristics of financial and ICT infrastructure for effectively supporting financial inclusion and uh, the widespread availability of digital financial services or DFS. Whereas the widespread availability of digital solutions for savings, credit, and payment provides people with access to financial services, payment interoperability enables these targeted people to transfer their money to any other individual without having to resort to multiple transaction accounts. The ITU focus group on digital financial services identified in 2016 a number of recommendations that authorities can use to promote interoperability for DFS. For instance, DFS authorities and providers should, should collaborate to achieve safe and commercially viable DFS interoperability. Authorities can promote interoperability through engagement with DFS providers and other key stakeholders. Financial authorities could take the lead on DFS interoperability strategies and policies, working with other authorities as required and engaging with providers and other key stakeholders. When working to implement interoperability, financial authorities should clarify the role of various public and private sector stakeholders, include all relevant stakeholders in the process, and leverage existing coordination structures where possible. For their part, DFS providers should pair primarily the responsibility for interoperability risk management. They should identify and effectively mitigate relevant risks and ensure that accountability for risk mitigation is properly addressed in the scheme's rules. In the previous two episodes of the webinar, the issue of cyber crimes and financial scams targeting digital financial services were discussed, highlighting the growing complexity of cyber risks. Digital financial service providers and payment service providers should undertake necessary steps to enhance their cyber resilience capabilities with the objective of limiting the escalating risk that cyber attacks and threats pose to availability and normal business operation. 
In this context, the resilience of digital payment infrastructure to anticipate, withstand, contain, and rapidly recover from a cyber attack is critical and also quite complex due to the role and interdependency of different stakeholders in the ecosystem. And when we overlay on top of financial market infrastructure organizations or FMEs, uh, FMIs, the mobile payment ecosystem, it is indeed a high intricate ecosystem. Such threats and risks should be carefully managed to minimize the impact to the stability of the payment system. The level of operational resilience of FMIs, including cyber resilience, can be a decisive factor in the overall resilience of the financial system and the broader economy. Under the Financial Inclusion Global Initiative, or FIGI, the Security Infrastructure and Trust Working Group, led by the ITU, developed the DFS Security Assurance Framework, which identified a number of threats and vulnerabilities at the level of the network infrastructure and DFS applications and security control measures that can be implemented by DFS providers and application service providers. The cybersecurity work stream led by the World Bank under the Security Infrastructure and Trust Working Group developed a methodology with the European Central Bank to operationalize the CPMI ISCO guidance on cyber resilience for FMIs, which could be used by FMI to uh, comply with the guidance and by authorities, supervisors, and overseers uh, to assess their FMIs against the guidance, hence enhancing the overall cyber resilience of financial market infrastructure, critical for financial stability and financial inclusion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to turn to our speakers. I will now be inviting our speakers in turn to make their presentations. Each speaker has about 15 minutes for the presentation. And our first speaker is Ms. Dorothy Delort from the World Bank Group. Dorothy, you have 15 minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Bilal. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be speaking to you today about uh, interoperability and resiliencies for uh, digital payment systems. Um, the World Bank uh, work um, a lot on critical foundations for digital payments and financial inclusion. And um, because these critical foundations will allow to build a strong uh, digital payment ecosystem. The objective per, that we pursue in our work on um, uh, these foundations are safety and efficiency of the national payment system. So safety is directly related to, to resiliency, of course, and within efficiency, you will see that interoperability is a critical component. So in order to work on this, um, to establish these uh, foundation or critical enablers for digital payments, we'll work on both um, the legal and regulatory framework, uh, the technical infrastructure, as well as public policies and private sector commitment based on this foundation can be established catalytic pillars such as transaction account and a design of payment product access point or digitalization of large value recurrent payment stream all of these within the objective of universal access to and frequent usage of transaction accounts so how does the World Bank work on these uh, critical foundation? Um, we do it with um, a wide scope of tools. Uh, they go from data and analytics. We have the données analytics. I'm sorry, I, I, we could hear the translator speaking. So let me resume, um, such as the global FINDEX, 
Um, we do it uh, with also a lot of research, diagnostic, especially at country level where we do uh, national payment system strategy or digital financial service uh, strategies, fintech uh, strategies. And through our um, lending role, uh, where by which we finance the critical infrastructure or uh, the changes that are uh, needed in order to establish a safe and efficient uh, payment system. Next, please. Next slide, please. Um, but our work is uh, also uh, on a number of product technology and access mode. So um, now that when you work on interoperability and resiliency uh, for national payment system, for uh, financial market infrastructure, we also have to take into account innovations in, in payment. And this innovation can uh, affect a product. Uh, and this is the case for uh, central bank digital currency, uh, open banking, instant payment, super apps, stable coins of, or electronic wallets. They, these technology um, affect underlying uh, technologies such as big data analytics, biometric, cloud computing, contactless technology, uh, DLT, digital ID, Internet of Things. And so all of these changes to product, to technologies, to access mode have to be taken into account when working on a diagnostic and uh, on recommendation for um, the national payment system or national financial inclusion uh, strategies. Next, please. So uh, in order to uh, achieve these goals of um, safe, efficient, cost-effective, inclusive uh, payment system um, supported by a safe and efficient uh, financial market infrastructure, um, we use um, standards that have been developed by standard setting bodies, uh, the CPMI and, and IOSCO, so the Committee for Payment and Market Infrastructure and uh, the similar committee for uh, securities um, system. And these uh, principles for financial market infrastructures can be categorized into nine broad categories. They include a number of key considerations and recommendation in order to improve um, general organization, such as legal basis, governance, uh, risk management, but also they include specific recommendations for credit risk and liquidity risk, for settlement risk, and um, general business risk, and a very important one, operational risk. Um, they also include specific principles related to access, efficiency, and transparency. Next, please. So these uh, PFMIs, these principles for financial market infrastructure, include a number of key considerations uh, and recommendations that will foster interoperability. Um, interoperability has to be based on the legal framework and system rules. Uh, in order to have um, non-bank payment service providers, you have to have a legal framework that will allow um, non-bank payment system provider to uh, exist in the market, that will set the rules for regulation, but also licensing, supervision and oversight of these non-bank payment service providers. These non-bank payment service providers have to be given access uh, to critical infrastructure in order to uh, foster interoperability. And this is, for that we have recommendation um, in the principle 18, 19 and 20. 
It, also, it is also key uh, that governance of financial market infrastructure um, take into account the need of all stakeholders and this will greatly contribute to interoperability. We see that in many countries, interoperability cannot be achieved uh, because some stakeholders are not adequately represented in the governance of critical financial market infrastructures. The central bank has also a key catalyst role to play, and one of these catalyst roles involve um, creating the condition for cooperation and dialogue with the stakeholders, especially on the issue of interoperability. Next, please. As far as uh, resiliency, I would like to insist on the fact that there's more than pure, uh, just operational reliability um, into resiliency. Resiliency starts by a legal resiliency uh, and a strong legal basis, especially for the settlement. Because if you don't have this um, strong legal basis for the settlement and the settlement can be challenged, then there's no possible resiliency for the financial market infrastructure, for payment system, and then for payment uh, services. There's also uh, what I would call an organizational resiliency. Uh, again, it has to do with the way governance is organized and the way uh, the risk management framework is organized. There's also a financial dimension to resiliency and it's a credit risk or liquidity risk, but also general business risk. Um, a payment system in order to be resilient has to have enough funding to be able to um, man manage its operation for at least six months. So this is the general business risk resilience. But what I would like to focus on more specifically is obviously operational resilience and um, a part of it will be uh, cyber resilience. Uh, next, please. Uh, next. So uh, for operational risk, I will, I will go very quickly, but the PFMI include a number of key considerations in order to identify the plausible sources of operational risk, both internal and external, mitigate their impact through the use of appropriate systems, policies, procedures, and controls. Systems should be designed to ensure a high degree of security and operational reliability and should have adequate, scalable capacity. Business continuity management should aim for timely recovery of operations and fulfillment of the FMI obligations, including in the event of a wide scale of or major disruption. And in the context of COVID, we, we see that um, uh, these principles have been in a way tested, especially operational risk, um, because of the potential unavailability of critical staff, because also of um, these critical staff might not be able at the level of the uh, payment system itself, but also at the level of the participants. So a number of uh, payment system operators and central bank have had to um, take specific measures in order to address the risk to operational uh, uh, resiliency that came uh, with the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Next, please. So you, some of the uh, key consideration, uh, the key consideration are quite detailed for principle 17, but it should be kept in mind that the philosophy of the PFMI is not to be prescriptive on especially how to achieve uh, the objective that are set in the principle, but give some flexibility to the payment system operator and to the supervisors as to how these objectives uh, might be achieved. Next, please. Mm -hmm. 
I would like now to, um, to zoom more specifically on, on cyber resilience. Um, and uh, I find this um, graph quite interesting because it does put into perspective um, the respective uh, uh, space that are uh, within risk management occupied by business continuity, uh, cyber resilience, information security, and information technology. And right now, I would like to uh, focus on cyber resilience, um, which is just a specific uh, aspect of operational reliability um, and uh, which include uh, cyber security. Next, please. Next, please. Can we have the next slide, please? So um, the CPMI IOSCO, which is the main uh, standard setting body for financial market infrastructure, felt it was needed to complement the PFMI by a specific guidance on cyber resilience for financial market infrastructure. And the guidance is structured in chapters defining five main risk management categories uh, which are governance, identification, protection, detection, and recovery, and three general components that should be uh, considered when um, talking about cyber resilience. And these general components are testing, situational awareness, learning, and evolving. And all together, they uh, uh, constitute the, the cyber resilience guidance. The problem with that guidance if, is that it's quite high level and generic, and we felt within the Fiji uh, Cyber Resilience for FMI Workstream that there was a need for a more specific tool or methodology to operationalize this um, CPMI IOSCO gui cyber guidance. And that's when we worked with the European Central Bank. Uh, we, which has developed a cyber resilience oversight expectation in order to um, provide uh, system operators and um, uh, authorities, both supervisors and overseers, uh, with a more detailed elaboration on how to implement the guidance. And so the, the CRO provide good practices which can be referred to when giving feedback to FMI for an authority and can be taken into, in, they do take into consideration the industry best practices already set out in different frameworks such as uh, the NIST framework or uh, the COVID. And, um, and next please, because, um, payment system and financial market infrastructure are very different from one country to another or even within the same country with different level of sophistication. Uh, three levels of uh, expectation have been defined um, based on uh, the level of sophistication of the system. Uh, next, please. These three levels are evolving level, advancing level, and innovating level for the most sophisticated uh, system. And I will just, um, next please, I would just suggest that you have a look um, either on the Fiji website or on the World Bank or European Central Bank uh, website for the CROW, because for each category, uh, they are very detailed um, uh, suggestion, recommendation, technical ones for governance, for identification, uh, protection, detection, response and recovery, testing. And in a way, they provide a very efficient tool in order to assess and improve the cyber resilience of a payment system on which will be built uh, the payment services and the especially the digital payment services for a country. 
And I will stop here because I've reached the end of my time. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take other questions later. Over to you, Bill. Thank you very much, uh, Dorothy, for sharing with us uh, very important information on the critical foundation for safety and efficiency of the digital payment system. Also, the principles for the financial market infrastructure in terms of uh, fostering interoperability and resiliency and including the non-bank service providers. Uh, and also for uh, highlighting the uh, principle 17 on the operational risk and the CPMI, IOSCO and how Fiji um, is working towards uh, helping implement that. Um, our next speaker is Kevin Butler from uh, University of Florida. Kevin, you have 15 minutes, please go ahead. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bilal. And uh, thank you to everybody uh, for, for joining. So I'm going to be talking uh, today about, um, let me just get my, um, uh, let me just get my uh, started up here. So can you uh, see my uh, screen? You can see my uh, slides. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, improving resilience in the DFS ecosystem with the security assurance framework. So uh, uh, the COVID-19... we don't see your slides yet. Oh, you Are don't. Are you sharing? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Let me uh, get that uh, sorted out for you very quickly. Uh, okay. Share screen. And... Okay. okay, can you see them now? Good. Now I can. Perfect. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has created uh, an, unprecedented, an unprecedented strain uh, on the world economy. Uh, we've seen uh, drastic changes in day-to-day -day life uh, in the way that, uh, uh, in, in the services that we use, um, and we're dealing with large-scale effects. And in many ways, uh, COVID-19 is exacerbating uh, existing inequalities. Uh, so mobile devices themselves uh, can play a unique role in maintaining connectivity and providing valuable services uh, to users uh, th through services as diverse as uh, helping to contain the spread of COVID uh, through contact tracing uh, to uh, the use of uh, digital financial services. Uh, and in many ways, uh, DFS uh, is very well situated uh, as a means of uh, dealing with uh, the pandemic. It means that uh, it mitigates the need for, uh, for physical travel, uh, physical remittance, and increases uh, safety from those standpoints. Uh, the DFS ecosystem, however, is uh, uniquely vulnerable to a variety of threats. Uh, and this is based on uh, three uh, primary uh, uh, reasons. Uh, one is the interconnectedness of the system entities. Uh, the second is the reliance on the numerous parties uh, involved in the DFS. Uh, and uh, the third is that the mobile ecosystem itself is increasingly complex, uh, both in terms of the devices that are being used and their capabilities and the uh, operating systems that these devices use, which are, again, becoming increasingly complex and uh, lead to uh, increased attack surfaces. So what I want to talk about today is a security framework in the context of, uh, of, of, of digital financial services. And a natural question you may be asking is, uh, why a security framework? Uh, where, how does a security come into play when we're talking about resilience uh, when dealing with large scale threats like, uh, as an example, COVID? So, let's uh, look at what the differences are between resilience and security because they're not identical, but they do share a lot of things in common. Uh, resilience is really about the ability to withstand and recover from operational hardships. So as Dorothy mentioned, uh, business continuity planning, uh, ensuring redundancy, um, identifying attack surfaces, the ability to restore operations. Uh, generally, when we think about security, we think about uh, specifically the protection of computing infrastructure. We're talking about cybersecurity here. Uh, protection of computing uh, systems and data against uh, primarily malicious adversaries. So I'll say that uh, thinking strictly about security uh, and a security policy that only considers protection against uh, malicious attack uh, will not in itself be 
uh, provide resilience. So if you have a cybersecurity policy, uh, that's a great starting point, but it in, it not, in itself is not necessarily going to be a, a full framework for, uh, uh, for resilience. However, if you have a security management framework, a security assurance framework that allows you to assess risk and to, that provides a means for uh, identifying and developing processes, uh, then uh, you have uh, a structure in place that will, uh, by virtue of um, having a means of developing risk assessment strategies and uh, processes in mind uh, to deal with uh, these sorts of issues, you will also uh, get uh, the benefits of uh, developing resilience as a result. So I want to talk about the security assurance framework. Uh, the security assurance framework has been developed under the Financial Inclusion Global Initiative, or Fiji's uh, Security Infrastructure and Trust uh, Working Group. And it aims to bridge the knowledge gap and recommends a structured methodology for risk management. So the framework can be used in a variety of ways. Uh, it has, its goals are, are, are multifaceted. Uh, for example, uh, by having a, a framework in place, it allows uh, the DFS uh, ecosystem to enhance uh, customer trust and confidence. It clarifies roles and responsibilities for each stakeholder within the ecosystem. Uh, it uh, allows uh, the identification of uh, security threats and vulnerabilities within the ecosystem uh, it uh, establishes security controls uh, for end-to-end -end security, and it allows for strengthening of management practices with respect to security risk management in a manner that's inclusive to all shareholders. And this in particular, all of these points in particular uh, allow for uh, increasing a resilience of the ecosystem as well. Uh, there's a URL here on the bottom, uh, the DFS uh, Security Assurance Framework. Uh, you can go to this uh, to this link, uh, and again, these uh, will be available afterwards as well. These slides, so you can uh, write it down now or uh, look at this later, uh, and you will find a, a copy of the uh, security assurance framework, which uh, I encourage you to uh, uh, read uh, at your leisure. So let me talk about uh, some concepts that are important to understand, so that you uh, are uh, able to, uh, so that we're on a common uh, uh, page with regards to uh, the terms that we're using when talking about the framework. Uh, these three uh, terms come up often. A vulnerability is a weakness in a system that can be exploited by an adversary, and a threat is the specific means by which that vulnerability is exploited. Uh, finally, the risk is the consequence of a threat being successfully deployed. Now, when we developed the security assurance framework, we used uh, ITUT's recommendation X805, which provides a foundation for uh, with regards to security. Uh, eight, very, eight different security dimensions are uh, defined in order to address security, ranging from access control and authentication to data integrity and privacy. Now, the elements of a DFS ecosystem, uh, there are many, and uh, this is a very high level overview. Uh, if you want a, a more granular uh, view of the various elements of the, the ecosystem, I'd encourage you to uh, look at the document. Uh, but at a high level, uh, and the parts that are of particular focus uh, uh, for, from, our, uh, from our standpoint, are uh, threefold, the user, uh, the mobile network operator, and uh, the digital financial service provider. Uh, the user is the target audience for DFS, who uses a mobile money application on a mobile device in order to access the DFS ecosystem. Uh, and this can be uh, through a, a feature phone, uh, through uh, USSD or interactive voice response or SMS, uh, or can be uh, on a smartphone uh, using an application. The MNO provides the communication infrastructure from wireless links through the provider network. And this is all aspects of that mobile infrastructure from the base station to the uh, operator services. And then the DFS provider handles the application components uh, and interfaces with payment systems and third party providers. So the way that we assess risk is uh, based on the deeming cycle of uh, plan, do, check, and act. So the PDCA phases. Uh, and as uh, Dorothy mentioned with regards to the CROW, the, uh, this idea of a feedback loop is, is, is essential when dealing with security or resilience. Now, um, the goal of our methodology is to monitor and review uh, depending on the stakeholder. So as an example, a regulator may review the controls uh, as well as the audits that are provided uh, by the DFS provider. And based on, uh, based on that information, 
uh, changes can be made accordingly. The context, uh, every uh, system is different, so the individual context is going to be necessary in order to have effective risk assessment, evaluation, and analysis. Uh, but having a, a standardized framework allows for uh, the individualization that can be used for any particular context. Now, in summary, the threats to the ecosystem, uh, we've identified, I believe it's uh, 17 different threats, um, uh, maybe more actually. Uh, but on a high level, uh, the, uh, we've, uh, with the framework, we've uh, examined uh, these threats as they are, uh, as they apply to various uh, stakeholders within the DFS ecosystem from the user through the device through the MNO, the DFS provider, and third party. And again, there's others that we talk about in the, uh, in the document itself. We've uh, developed 118 different controls uh, that can be uh, used uh, as a means of mitigating and addressing uh, the threats uh, that are laid out here. And uh, incidentally, uh, under each of these uh, uh, stakeholders, you'll see examples of uh, threats and uh, the numbers in parentheses refer to the section in the report. Where we, uh, where we discuss those issues. So let me talk about an example threat, uh, denial of service or DOS. Um, it's one example of the standardized threats that we consider and it's mentioned in section 8.7 of the document. Uh, DO, uh, denial of service attacks can be characterized as attacks designed to prevent services within the DFS ecosystem from being offered. Now one important uh, uh, Takeaway and 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 de, uh, denial of service is particularly uh, related to uh, resilience because uh, denial of service isn't always caused by malice. It looks like an attack, but it's not always because of an attack. Uh, it can be the result of service oversubscription, for example, a sudden and massive rise in usage. And certainly, uh, in COVID, we've seen that with particular uh, service providers uh, seeing uh, very large uptakes in, uh, in in usership in a very small amount of time. Uh, and depending on what that time frame is, uh, the results can be uh, almost indistinguishable from an actual attack. Now, uh, the affected entities that we examine in the context of uh, DFS are the mobile network operator and the DFS provider. So let me talk, uh, and in order to keep this uh, on time, I'm only going to talk about uh, uh, the MNO. So we have, um, as an example, um, the risks, vulnerabilities, and controls from the perspective of the mobile network operator. Uh, from the standpoint of the risks, we have um, an inability to perform transactions due to a service outage uh, and a transaction failure due to high delays. These are the consequences of uh, a successful denial of service. Now, the, the vulnerability, what makes this possible is a network uh, failure due to insufficient network capacity or due to uh, maintenance or uh, implicit design of the, uh, uh, of the infrastructure. And the security dimension, uh, the ITU x805 uh, security dimension uh, that comes into play here is availability. So the controls that we've, uh, uh, that we've specified in the document are controls 22 and 23. Uh, the mobile network operator should take steps to ensure network high av and, uh, availability uh, in order to allow access to DFS services through USSD, SMS, and the internet. Uh, and the control 23, it says that uh, the mobile network operator should perform technical capacity tests simulating different transactions based on customer numbers, expected growth, expected number of transactions, and expected peak periods to ensure continued system performance. Now, the document itself is designed to provide actionable controls. Again, because every uh, context is individual, um, we go to varying levels of specificity with regards to the controls. Um, but uh, the uh, information uh, will allow um, MNOs and uh, DFS providers uh, to uh, set up and ensure that their, uh, their, their infrastructure is, is secure if these are followed. So in summary, uh, the security assurance framework is designed to provide guidance to stakeholders within the DFS ecosystem. And it's not designed to be a static document because technical advice changes, because uh, the state of technology changes and the state of security changes. Uh, the, uh, the document is meant to be a, a living one where security advice will evolve as new access technologies, vulnerabilities, and threats uh, are discovered. And uh, especially with regards to resilience, a systematic approach to developing processes and controls that are informed by threats and risks against the DFS ecosystem 
uh, will assure the resilience of the DFS ecosystem. So uh, this document uh, can be a means of uh, assuring that your system, uh, your infrastructure in ecosystem are developed to be resilient against uh, attackers, both uh, uh, both malicious attackers and uh, uh, threats to uh, the ecosystem, uh, such as what we've seen with COVID. So with that, I'm uh, happy to, uh, well, we'll be taking questions after our panel, but uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin Butler, University of Florida, for really introducing to us the uh, security assurance framework and uh, the three components, uh, the user, the MNO, the DFS provider, and uh, giving us an example uh, of some of the controls that need to be in place. And uh, thank you for the reference to the X805 uh, 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 security dimensions. And those are, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the security uh, framework is an important element of providing resiliency, or it's a foundational element to provide it. So we'll come back later, as you mentioned, for uh, questions and answers. Um, I'd like now to move to our next speaker, Mr. Anant uh, from GSMA. You have 15 minutes, please. Thank you very much, Bilal. Um, uh, can you hear me clearly firstly, and are you able yes. to see me? Yes, you are. Let me share my screen. Um, right. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, I can put it in Let slide mode that. and please go ahead. Perfect, excellent. Well, thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, uh, just by way of a quick introduction, I'm not much familiar with the GSMA. I, I work at the GSMA, which is the GSM Association. It's an industry body for mobile operators uh, globally. And within the GSMA, I work in a team called the Mobile Money Team. We work with the 279 odd mobile money services available globally. And even within that, I work specifically in the Inclusive Tech Lab, which is a technical facility uh, that sits within the GSMA Mobile Money Team. And we work directly with mobile operators and digital financial service providers on technical projects to further developmental goals. Um, the overall context um, in which we got involved in the topic uh, today is that the mobile money industry is growing rapidly. And that's what I've got here on the first slide. Um, for over a decade, the industry has been driving financial inclusion, opening access to digital transactions and giving people the tools to better manage their financial lives. Uh, today, there are over 1 billion registered mobile money accounts globally spread across 290 mobile money deployments that are live in 95 countries. Um, the rapid rise of mobile money has, of course, been accompanied by an increasing emphasis on the need for account-to-account -account interoperability. Now, in some markets, service providers have proactively adopted interoperability, either via bilateral connections or through an intermediary drawn by the promise of commercial and strategic advantage. In others, the government or the regulator has taken a more active role and created a central infrastructure that players have been encouraged to join. And in even other places, regional interoperability projects are underway with regional associations promoting centralized assets to bring about a more interconnected financial ecosystem. Uh, and beyond this, other market developments, such as the launch of a mobile industry-led scheme and the provision of industry access by philanthropic organizations really complete what is today a quite complex picture on the different ways in which interoperability can be achieved. Now, Faced with this wide array of potential routes into interoperability, for a, a provider of financial services in emerging markets, I, I think the term that was used by Dorothy in the earlier presentation was non-bank payment service providers. I work for uh, such non-bank payment service providers, essentially in the mobile money industry. It can be a very difficult choice to assess which technical model is the best one to adopt for, um, for interoperability in their market. And as the mobile money team of the GSMA, we work with members who constantly ask us, what do you think is the right approach for our market? And that is why the GSMA Inclusive Tech Lab recently produced a report that addresses that question. Um, and, and that's what you've got here on your screen on the left side. It's called the many paths to mobile money interoperability, selecting the right technical model for your market. Now, before I proceed further, um, maybe just a, a line to say, the connection between this piece of work and the topic of today's discussion is that 
indeed one of the factors that we have identified in this report uh, towards the end, which I will share with you, is the resilience of the interoperability model um, that is adopted, the technical model. We've called it robustness in our report. So there is a, is, there is a place where um, the work that we've done, the primary reason for which was to inform our own industry as to which technical model they should adopt for interoperability and how they should make that decision, uh, overlaps with the topic that we are discussing today, which is resilience is extremely important in interoperable solutions. But we, we'll come to that in just a second. Um, it, coming back to the report, we've adopted a very simple methodology to unlock the question of which model is the right one for a particular DFSP. Um, we do this by defining five core components that we think are the foundational building blocks of any interoperable solution. And these are up on your screen right now. We basically call them connection, settlement, governance, pricing and business model, and dispute resolution mechanisms. Now, uh, this is a subjective exercise. You know, there are, I'm sure there are people who would like to uh, think of interoperability along the lines of some other foundational elements. But uh, you know, this is the best way that we could think of to distill all interoperability models down to their core fundamentals. And, and very briefly, connection refers to the interconnection layer between participants that enables the exchange of information and the execution of contracts. Uh, settlement, um, uh, of course, refers to the flow of real money between participants to reflect the transactions executed between them. Governance, um, as uh, uh, again in Dorothy's presentation, uh, uh, talks about how the participants of that particular interoperability model make decisions regarding it. And that is indeed one of the sticking points when it comes to the adoption of inter interoperability in many markets, because uh, as we heard, uh, many systems do not take into account the needs of all stakeholders. Pricing and business model is self-explanatory. It simply refers to the levers that can be used to generate the revenue for the long-term sustainability of the interoperability model. And finally, dispute resolution mechanism, of course, refers to how participants can resolve disputes between them. So if we take these as the five fundamental components of any interoperability solution from a technical point of view, then there are, under each one of these broad components, there are a number of potential options. And again, this is a, a broad characterization that we've got here. Um, and, and, hello? I think I heard maybe the, the French uh, translation. So the, the, the broad character, the, the characterization of these five fundamental components, in front of each one, one of them, there are a number of options. So under connection, you can either have a bilateral connection between the players themselves, one-to-one, -one, or you can have some sort of centralized hub. Uh, that's obvious. Um, in terms of settlement, um, again, we use terminology here that perhaps payments purists might think that's not quite accurate. But either you can park the money with your counterparts before the transaction is done, and that is called pre-funding based, or you can uh, settle after the transactions have been executed, and that is called clearing based in our, uh, um, our model here. Um, governance can either be full or partial. You can actually have full control over the solution if you actually own it, or you can have partial control over it. In terms of business model, you can do a number of things to charge for an interoperable solution. You can have a processing fee. If there is a hub, you can have interchange between players. And of course, you can even, we don't recommend it, but you can even put a charge, a surcharge on clients for interoperable transactions. And finally, dispute resolution can either be consensus-based or arbitration-based. Uh, before I move to the next slide, maybe just worth pointing out here that these options under each component are not, inter are not independent of the options available under other components. They are interdependent. So for example, if under connection, which is the first core component, the choice that is exercised in the market is, let's say, a hub-based model, then under governance, the participants in that market will, uh, by definition, have reduced control unless they own that hub themselves. Um, so, you know, the, the option that is exercised under one component will influence the options that are available to you under other components. Now, let me move on very quickly to I, you know, showcase here um, what happens when you, when you match different permutations and combinations of those various options under the five core components. Um, you come up with a number of different scenarios, but what you've got here on the slide are the four viable technical models for interoperability. There's essentially four ways in which you can get the DFSPs in a market to be interoperable based on our work. You can either have the classic bilateral model, that's the first one on the top left, or you can have what is a, what we call an aggregator-led model, um, the second of the four models. 
The third one, because we are from the mobile money industry, we call the mobile money hub model. So that's a, basically a hub model, but where the hub is owned by the industry itself. And then the fourth one is a global payments hub model, where you've got a hub in the middle, but, but you know, it's, it's owned by somebody else, not by the DFSPs themselves. So you've got these four broad models that are characterized for technical interoperability in, in our, our report. And each one of these models has a distinct technical architecture. So if you look on the left of the slide, I, I haven't uh, bored you with the various sort of technical diagrams, which are very, uh, you know, I welcome you to read this report after this presentation. But on the left, you basically got the three um, uh, technical uh, diagrams of these models, the bilateral, the aggregator model, and for hub model, whether it's mobile money led or, or a global payments hub, uh, basically the architecture technically is the same. And that, that technical architecture, uh, the important point of this slide is that the model you go for will have an architecture. That architecture is going to have an impact uh, in terms of, of course, technical uh, parameters on top, but also commercial and business parameters. So on your screen, uh, on, the, on the top, you see um, the technical, on the technical side, the impact will be on things like API design and protocols, account identification, processing capacity and scalability, uh, the amount of time that's available for a transaction to be completed, uh, what, what is the implication of that for markets where most customers are dealing on a USSD um, uh, session? And what is the breakdown risk? I think as, uh, as um, uh, Kevin pointed out, uh, what we mean here by a, a breakdown risk is indeed not just, the, uh, not just the chance of a system breaking down, but your ability to get back from that. We are actually dealing here, uh, we're referring here to resilience, not just um, uh, security. And then on the commercial and business implications, of course, the capex and the opex of a system will depend entirely upon um, you know, what kind of technical architecture have you gone for, time to market, how long does it take to get it up, pre-funding and liquidity requirements can vary between systems, and indeed also the dynamics with other stakeholders. Are you able to actually freely, freely engage with other players connected to that system, or are you restricted because of the system in the middle, and how long does it take for you to connect to them? These are just, just an overview of the many parameters that are impacted by your choice of technology for becoming interoperable, which is not one way as we identified in this report, there are many ways. And finally, coming to the end of our analysis, we produced a high level, uh, and I emphasize that it's a high level qualitative assessment of the four broad technical models that we have uh, identified in our report and tried to assess from a mobile money uh, provider's perspective, again, because that is, those are the stakeholders we work with, which what are the strengths and weaknesses of these different models? And, and again, I, I'll put on in big letters on the right side, the key point here is that there is no right or one answer. All models have pluses and minuses. Uh, and what we've tried to do is to provide providers of financial services in emerging markets, non-bank uh, providers particularly, with a kind of toolbox so that they can assess different options and make an informed decision rather than simply be pushed in the direction of, of one model or the other. Uh, and I'll, I'll simply uh, mention the overall GSMA position on interoperability before ending, which is, um, you know, we believe that interoperability is extremely important. Of course, we, we echo the sentiments of our earlier presentations on the importance of people being able to send and receive money and, and all the rest of that. But we also feel that for its long-term sustainability, it's extremely important that interoperability is led by the market. Its timing and method must be determined by the players that are providing financial services and market, because they are the ones who best understand how this is going to be sustainable in the long term. So that is the overall uh, view that the GSMA has on interoperability. Um, I'm very, very grateful that you allowed us to share our research with you. Uh, despite the fact that we have been fairly uh, high level in our analysis, if you were to ask me later, do I have a view on which model is the best one? I do. Uh, and if you ask me that question, I, I will give you an answer later. So I'll just I'll leave you with that. Um, if you want to know more, more about this report, please feel free to get in touch with us at the GSMA Inclusive Tech Lab, and we'd be very happy to tell you more about it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen there. And uh, Bilal, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Anant, uh, for sharing with us the uh, GMS, GSMA interoperability model. You mentioned the connection, the settlement, the governance, the pricing or business model, and the dis dispute resolution uh, with the various um, options, if you will, in terms of uh, addressing those points. Uh, I also retain some very interesting numbers that stress the need for interoperability, the 279 mobile money providers worldwide, 
uh, the billion uh, mobile money accounts, uh, the 22 billion uh, in circulation, and the 2 billion or so processed payments per day. So that clearly indicates that uh, this is really at massive scale worldwide, and uh, it highlights the importance of interoperability and, uh, and the resilience of that uh, system. Indeed. Indeed, and may, may I correct myself, Bilal, it's 290 mobile money services. I made a mistake when I said 290. 290. So that number grows every year. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for that uh, correction. Um, I'd like now to move to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Notial. Um, sorry, uh, our next speaker, speaker is Mr. Salah Khan from UPO. Uh, Mr. Khan, you have 15 minutes, please. Thank you. Um, Bilal, I'll just share my screen here. Right. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak on this uh, very important topic. And I quickly wanted to introduce the topic before handing it over to my colleague. And what I, what I really want to get at is that the polls around the world and the last time we checked um, actually caters to over a billion people around the world. Um, providing all kinds of services from um, savings to money transfers to remittances to um, loans where it's allowed. And having this broad network and reach around the world actually um, provides the governments an opportunity to leverage the infrastructure and the capabilities of the post to provide services during these times of uncertainty and um, during the pandemic. And we're seeing across the world that the posts are classified as essential services. And um, you know, while people are being forced to stay at home, the post is actually bringing a number of these financial services to the doorstep of the people and offering a lifeline to those who are stuck at home. Um, leveraging what, what we know are their trusted relationship with communities and the physical reach, the post is making an obvious partner to, to um, uh, governments around the world. And examples of that is available on our website. There's a link at the end of the presentation that uh, you can all uh, go and uh, visit. Um, and what we are seeing is that remittances are increasing through the post. Um, people are accessing cash at their homes, um, delivered by post persons, um, pensions are being delivered. So the post is is essentially providing a resilient mechanism for linking the formal financial system to the, um, to the people who are at home. And one of the best examples that we have is from India Post. And I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Singh, who's an AGD at the Department of Post in India to sort of explain how the um, India Post is making a difference here. Um, Avinav, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Uh, good, af good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, I'll just... Uh, Start my video, am I visible? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Just I'll share my screen. Is the screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can go ahead, please. Yeah. So I would uh, thanks for this opportunity. First of all, uh, to present uh, the uh, the digital payment system in India, which actually is a living example of you know interoperability and resilience, especially as uh, Mr. Khan mentioned in times of COVID. You know how post uh, postal operators across the world have been classified as essential services provider and how they have been um, sort of. Uh, been a bulk work against uh, in uh, in these times. So uh, my presentation would involve a bit of uh, uh, digital financial inclusion, the journey of financial inclusion in India, and how uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, treating digital financial infrastructure a public good, and how it uh, sort of has uh, brought in fold a lot of people who would otherwise have been left, uh, uh, I mean, outside the, the ambit of financial inclusion. And uh, how India Post Payment Bank, I mean, India Post through India Post Payment Bank has uh, tapped into this, uh, uh, this framework and how we have built a resilient uh, uh, and interoperable, I mean, services uh, banking network across the India. So as Mr. Khan pointed out, postal uh, financial uh, services network comprises of almost 1.96 billion accounts. Uh, and uh, most of the postal operators, they provide money transfers, remittances, bill payments, and government to person uh, payments. 
However, only 8% of the postal operators operate as a full-fledged bank. Now, uh, the role of postal, postal operators in financial inclusion is, uh, is huge and also financial inclusion as a, a developmental goal. You know, it's very important because there is a strong correlation between uh, the number of bank accounts and GDP per capita and studies have proven that. And also, uh, and because of this, uh, financial uh, inclusion has been, have been included, integrated into seven of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals of United Nations. It is a, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I mean, almost there are, even with the, uh, the leap that, uh, that uh, I mean, uh, the world has seen in terms of fintechs and uh, financial technologies, there are even now uh, 1.7 billion people who are still financially excluded, out of which more than a billion are women. So there is a, uh, I mean, there are a lot of gender disparity uh, in terms of financial inclusion and digital financial inclusion is what can help. I mean, it can help us in bringing down uh, the costs of including these people within the financial framework. So as I mentioned, I mean, uh, postal operators, because of the uh, trust that they enjoy among uh, the communities in which they work and uh, also how, I mean, the, the way they can uh, mitigate the accessibility and availability challenges, uh, they can be a major uh, player in terms of uh, uh, financial digital financial inclusion. So uh, just a bit about India Post. India Post uh, has almost 160 years uh, legacy. It is the world's largest postal network with 155,000 post offices, which are connected through a secure VPN network. And also each of these access points uh, are connected through a core banking system. So traditionally, uh, post office, India Post has been providing saving schemes uh, and, we, uh, and it has more than 360 million savings account. Uh, with a saving mobilization of more than 8 trillion rupees. Uh, however, uh, there was, it, was, it was felt that uh, in order to uh, provide the, digit, uh, the latest financial technologies and the digital payment services to the last mile, especially the rural and the I mean, rural areas, it is important to have a payment, uh, uh, payment technology setup and for which India, India Post had applied for a license uh, 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 for a payments bank and which it got and now we have an entity called India Post Payment Bank. So I would take you through the journey of, I mean, uh, the critical enablers for digital financial inclusion in India. So actually in 2008, there only one in four Indians had a bank account. Now, if we, if uh, the regulator, I mean, if the regulators would have gone through the normal and uh, traditional banking, it would have taken them 47 years to take this coverage to 80 Percent. However, uh, because of the interplay of regulator and the regulated entity, as I would uh, sort of, uh, I mean, uh, display in the next slides, uh, this whole journey, I mean, almost 90 uh, percent of Indians now have an account, and it has been uh, a shiny example of how regulator and regulated ent entities can come together to achieve scalable financial inclusion. So. In 2008, uh, the regulator in India, which is Reserve Bank of India, the central bank, uh, it basically uh, adopted a bank-led model for financial inclusion, where it, it mandated banks to open physical branches in rural areas. Secondly, it uh, went ahead and uh, sort of mandated a simple basic sim uh, savings bank account for all the, uh, for the people in rural areas, which actually enabled almost 380 million uh, citizens to open a bank account which was a, uh, almost, and this actually enabled 90% uh, of Indians now to have a bank account. Secondly, it created differentiated category of differentiated banks, uh, amongst which a small finance bank and payments bank, uh, and India Post Payments Bank is one of the differentiated banks that have been set up uh, under this category. Thirdly, it uh, sort of enabled uh, banks to operate through banking correspondents who are uh, basically uh, access points of banks, not uh, physical brick and mortar branches, but uh, they, are, they can uh, operate as an interoperable uh, you know, setup where they can be, uh, I mean, onboarded by multiple banks and provide services of various banks. So, uh, this was accompanied by a large scale digitization of, uh, uh, of, of Indian populace, for instance, Right now, we have more than a billion uh, mobile phone users, uh, more than 500 million smartphone users, and uh, by the end of December uh, 2020, we would have uh, more than 640 million internet users. Now, this has actually enabled a lot uh, digital financial inclusion to penetrate even in the rural areas. Uh, one of the major enabler uh, in this journey has been uh, provision of digital ID. So, for instance, in 2008, now only one in uh, 25 in I mean less than a uh, sort of a 125th Indian have dig had digital identity. 
uh, which was a critical uh, sort of uh, uh, enabler. I mean, with, uh, critical element for opening a bank account or for having a uh, getting into the financial system. Uh, so Indian uh, government basically, uh, you know, uh, started the world's largest uh, biometric program in terms of Aadhaar, which is a unique identity uh, program. And uh, today, uh, I mean, from that uh, situation in 2008, today we have more than 126 billion Indian citizens having a digital biometric identity. Now this identity, as I would uh, later on uh, touch upon, this uh, enabled a lot of other products to be developed on top of this Aadhaar uh, uh, innovation, and which had actually, uh, you know, uh, enabled uh, digital financial inclusion in a big way. Other digital uh, initiatives would, uh, for instance, Indian government started a framework uh, mission called Digital India Mission, through which it in a sort of uh, sought to build capacities at the last mile in terms of providing point of sale machines and uh, other infrastructure and providing subsidies to have that. So in, in terms of the FinTech innovations uh, that have uh, sort of uh, uh, um, had played a major, major role uh, is Jandhan, Aadhaar and Mobile Trinity. So basically a combination of having a lot of bank accounts along with uh, uh, authentication mechanism in terms of Aadhaar and access to those accounts through mobile. Uh, this uh, has enabled, these are have been a major building block for the digital financial system in India. Uh, India stack, as I would delve on uh, in the next slide, I mean, it, had, it has provided a presence-less, paperless, and cashless platform to bring India's population uh, into the digital age, uh, which is India stack, uh, by the way, is in largest open a API uh, in the world. Uh, tapping into all this, I mean, government of government to pay, uh, person uh, payments have actually taken, uh, uh, I mean, uh, have been authenticated in a much more uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, better way and uh, that through direct benefit transfers by directly transferring the uh, uh, government to uh, payment a uh, person payments directly into the bank account and authenticated by Aadhaar, government of India has more or less saved uh, roughly 23 billion dollars over the years. So, so about India stack, uh, India stack uh, is basically an open access API uh, built on the premise that digital infrastructure is a public good. Now, majority of the digital payment system that had existed uh, previous to this were peer to peer uh, so they they were closed loop uh, payment systems uh, because of india stack uh, we could create an open uh, loop system which was switch based and therefore interoperable and scalable so i will go into each of these layers uh, and also uh, because of the stack architecture, I mean, uh, which being modular and layered, it has actually enabled, uh, enabled I mean, created a payment system, which is uh, characterized by interoperability. So each platform here, each layer is actually designed within the regulatory system. So one of the uh, points, uh, uh, I mean, uh, mentioned by Dorothy was that these payment, uh, the systems that are created, they should be well regulated for, uh, for them to be resilient. And actually, each of these systems are uh, created within the regulatory framework. And uh, therefore, and when combined, they provide a uh, low cost scalable products, which provide better service experience. So the first layer is the presenceless layer, which is actually uh, enabled through the Aadhaar digital ID project that I had uh, uh, mentioned uh, pre previous. To, I mean, in my previous slide, uh, Aadhaar, as I mentioned, ena enabled several innovative digital platforms which are built at public good. Uh, Aadhaar allows authentication of identity on demand without the need for physical presence of the person, and it has uh, enabled. Uh, lowering of transaction costs and uh, without the need for every player to come and build their separate infrastructure. Uh, so as I mentioned, it is built as a public good, which is uh, available for others through API access or uh, tapping into the system. The second layer, uh, which is built on top of the presence layer, which is the Aadhaar layer, is paperless layer. So basically, uh, one of the use cases is eKYC, which is used for authentication of uh, of, of an account holder or a customer. Uh, this paperless layer stores and retrieves information digitally. So it sits on top of the presenceless layer and it has enabled paperless opening of accounts. So, yeah, and that can be a uh, multiple uh, types of accounts so is a mobile uh, account or uh, I mean a mobile SIM card can be purchased through EKYC uh, done through Aadhaar authentication or a bank account. So for instance, in India, a recent startup, 
uh, I mean, built on huge uh, customers customer base uh, just because of this EKYC operations in within a um, I mean month or two. I mean they were able to onboard uh, roughly 200 million customers. So EKYC was launched in 2012, and since then there have been almost 8.4 billion authentication that have been carried out through this platform. So this has been one of the major use cases of India Stack, and it has drastically reduced the transaction cost for performing an authentication. For instance, initially, I mean prior to the, uh, this India Stack, the average cost of uh, doing an EKYC was roughly $15, which has been brought down to seven cents. So. It has sort of, uh, you know, enabled uh, uh, the. Uh, I mean, a lot of people to come into the the, uh, the digital fold without uh, a prohibitive cost. Uh, also, eKYC acts as a foundational KYC for so because for registering the eKYC, one needs to be present physically. But after that, there is no need for a physical presence, and uh, it can be the second factor authentication by insurance providers or by. Uh, securities providers can be carried out uh, without the physical presence of the person. The third layer uh, is the cashless layer. And uh, one of the products that have been developed is Unified Payment Interface, which is an instant real-time payment system, which has been developed by uh, National Payments Corporation of India, which is uh, a body which has been, which is uh, owned by RBI and other 56 other commercial uh, banks. So it is a very good example of how regulator and the regulated entities combine and uh, sort of create a public good, uh, which would otherwise not have been possible. Now this UPI, uh, what this has done is that it has created, uh, I mean, uh, a sort of virtual payment address for each customer and it, it functions 24 seven. So it's a platform which functions 24 seven and it has an interoperable architecture. So a person needs to have only one mobile app and it can, op I mean, it can uh, manage money across banks and across uh, 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 financial service providers. Uh, today, the more than 155 banks are live on UPI uh, with more than 1.3 billion monthly transactions uh, happening uh, uh, worth 2.61 trillion rupees. Uh, it can be compared to the number of car transactions that happen monthly in India, which is roughly in the range of seven to 800 million. So UPI has actually uh, been a boon for uh, digital retail payments, which are small amount of payments, uh, not bulk payments, but uh, retail payments. and because of the low costs, it, it is very popular. Uh, one other thing that UPI has done that it is it has an open entry system, but it is regulated. So even those who are not uh, sort of within the framework, I mean, uh, not financial service provider, do uh, come into, I mean, can be part of this UPI system with, with the help of uh, the financial service providers. Uh, the last layer is the consent layer. Uh, so all these three layers generate a lot of data. Now this digital data, which is obtained after, uh, can be obtained at marginal cost and it is a non-rival good. So it can be used by many um, entities without loss of content. Uh, in the consent layer, consent layer, the philosophy is that uh, the user is given the uh, sort of uh, uh, empowered with his data. And uh, uh, so uh, previously, the data that was residing in silos is now brought about uh, and through uh, account aggregator, which is again a regulated data fiduciary entity uh, regulated by RBI. And this uh, entity acts as a consent uh, manager for the transfer of data from uh, from the customer to various entities and that the entity them, themselves cannot see the data. So as I mentioned, this, uh, this India stack has actually uh, created a interoperable system, which is platform uh, level interoperable. And also the regulations of having banking correspondence and product suits like AEPS, IMPS has created an agent level uh, interoperability. And also uh, the various regulators coming together, uh, the mobile operator, uh, the mobile regulator, insurance regulator, they have created a customer level interoperability uh, within this uh, India stack framework. Uh, as uh, mentioned, uh, because of being a regulated, uh, uh, sort of regulated system, it is a, uh, resilient uh, infrastructure. Now I would come to India Post Payment Bank. I mean, uh, uh, as I mentioned, one of the major challenges uh, in spite of the banking network was uh, of accessibility and uh, India Post Payment Bank, the moment it was launched, I mean, with 200,000 uh, 200, postmen operating as doorstep banking providers, um, it in, in one go, it has uh, sort of uh, multiplied the rural banking infrastructure by 2.5 times and reduced the banking network 
uh, distance to bank from five, uh, 10 kilometers to 5 kilometers. It has leveraged technology and physical reach of India Post uh, to provide uh, banking services and a bouquet of banking services at the doorstep. Uh, the, the products that are being offered through India Post Payment Bank are mostly technology focused products which are enabling ease of banking and also uh, as I mentioned uh, with the help of UPI and other uh, uh, AEPS which is Aadhaar Enabled Payment System uh, India Post has created an interoperable uh, architecture, interoperable banking network through which uh, services of any bank can be accessed at the doorstep with the help of a postman. So this is a basic uh, paraphernalia of what how uh, uh, interoperable banking is provided at the doorstep. A mobile phone uh, connected with a biometric device where biometric authentication is done and a linked bank account can be accessed for cash withdrawal, deposits, money transfers and balance inquiries. So, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, in the COVID times during lockdown, a lot of other players, financial service providers were uh, not able to uh, work, whereas government of India had transferred huge amount of cash transfers to people and to help them, uh, you know, tide through these times. Uh, as you can see, over the uh, April, May and June were the lockdown period in uh, India and the transaction, the industry-wide transactions had also almost tripled and also the IPPB, the India Post Payment Bank uh, transactions almost uh, multiplied by 10 times. But actually it is a, a sort of reflection on the resiliency of the and the scalability of the architecture that is created that uh, uh, we could very easily provide, I mean, uh, uh, these volumes uh, in, without, a, uh, without a much problem. Now, the way forward, I think, is uh, to treat uh, as I mentioned, digital financial infrastructure as a public good because the cost can be prohibitive, especially the switch based uh, infrastructure and then expand oper interoperability across regulators, which can be insurance providers, the, uh, the mobile operators and the other regulators and also create redundancy within the payment infrastructure. So in spite of the fact that this India stack is doing pretty well and the NPCI, which is the entity right now uh, dealing with the cashless layer, um, the Reserve Bank of India, the central bank has already uh, floated uh, proposals for onboarding other payment service providers who can build um, parallel systems. So in order to build in resiliency. Also, one of the major things is to develop smart and digital, uh, smart digital financial products or which can be actually, uh, I mean, operated by the rural population or the person who is not very digitally literate. And also one of the major other things is to build capacity at the last mile so that these uh, financial uh, products that we are building, I mean, they can be uh, sort of uh, accessed by uh, pe people at the last mile, especially for a country uh, of, uh, you know, expand uh, of uh, geography of India. So that would be it. Uh, this is a picture of a QR card, the IPV QR card. Uh, so I'll be available for questions after this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Khan and Mr. Singh for sharing with us the example of the, uh, first of all, the overall UPU uh, and the postal service reach worldwide and, uh, and a very concrete example in, uh, in India. And uh, of course, how the uh, Indian uh, uh, g government and country has been able to quickly uh, scale up uh, to 360 million savings account and uh, digital financial transactions uh, based on the uh, India stack that you clearly uh, shared with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that ends the presentations. Now we're moving into the questions and answer se uh, section of our uh, episode today. Um, I see that some questions have already been um, provided on the Q&A uh, chart. There is a question for Dorothy. Um, excellent presentation, very detailed coverage. Can you please elaborate a bit further on what is the right time for uh, overseas to you, uh, overseers to use CORE for assessment of FMIs? Uh, and there is a question for uh, Mr. Abhinav. How is security and resilience integrated in the India stack? So maybe I'll start with Abhinav since you're describing the India stack and see if you can quickly address the uh, question on how security and resilience is integrated. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Bilal. Uh, so as I mentioned, I mean, as I mentioned, the India stack, uh, each of the layers within the India stack is uh, is sort of regulated within a regulatory framework. So, and each of them have very uh, high security, uh, I mean, uh, follow very high security protocols. And 
I mean, even independent, I mean, they, and there is only API access that can, and that is enabled uh, for each of those layers. Each of these layers are again controlled independently by multiple players. For instance, the Aadhaar layer is controlled by UIDAI. Similarly, the presence list layer EKYC is controlled by METI, the Ministry of Information, uh, Electronics and Information Technology in India. The cashless layer is uh, controlled by a regulated entity called NPCI, the National Payments Corporation of India. And the uh, the presence, uh, the sorry, uh, the consent layer uh, is, uh, uh, which is the basically account aggregators, uh, is again uh, an entry. I mean, uh, a layer which is controlled by RBI. So each of these layers are independently handled by multiple uh, regulators and uh, within the security framework, uh, which which actually results in resilience uh, of of the whole system. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I understand Dorothy had to leave to another call, so she's not available to answer the question, but would be, we would be happy to follow up offline for the, uh, the, the requester. Uh, we have about seven minutes left in our webinar today. I'd like to ask um, uh, Anant maybe a quick question. You mentioned in your presentation that uh, you have your uh, preferred model. So having studied all these different technical models of interoperability, is there one that you would say is better than others in uh, for financial service providers in emerging markets? Anand? Yeah, Bill, Bill and I, I hope I don't get into trouble for this, yeah, because uh, <laughs> uh, look, all of these models are supported by very driven uh, and people who want the best for the industry. But of course, once they suggest a model, they take a position on it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say it, and uh, you know, let's see what happens tomorrow. Okay. But uh, look, I think I just want to emphasize it's it's. Um, it's, it's a hard question to answer because it's like asking, you know, is there a good way to build a bridge? And of course, you know, it depends on what kind of traffic you're expecting and where you want to build a bridge. It depends on what the conditions are that will determine what kind of bridge you're going to have. You can have a big bridge, a rope bridge, or you can have a cantilever bridge. So it's, it's that kind of question. But despite that, I'm, I'm going to give you a clear answer for at least my part of the world. Um, you know, the people that we work with. But before that, maybe I can just identify, you should always look at four things when you're discussing what kind of interoperability model is best for you. You've obviously got to look at cost. You know, if you're gonna go for a system that is much more expensive than what you can afford, that's obviously not a great, it's a non-starter. Mm -hmm. You've got to also look at scalability. I think this question came up in, uh, in both the presentations of um, Dorothy and Kevin as well, I think. So if the system is gonna be useful tomorrow, you should be able to use it for, for connecting with many more players than the initial set that you get through using that system. You need to be robust, and this comes down to the whole resilience question we're having today. If the system, for whatever reason, has a breakdown, you should be able to get back up and running with that. And finally, uh, the point about governance, you know, enough has been said about it. You need to be comfortable that you're in control of this. If you ask these questions and you come to an answer, that should tell you what bridge you should build. Now, the players that we work with in the markets where we work, you know, I, you, can, you can go for all of these models, you know, the bilateral model, the aggregator led model, the global payments model, but really we feel that if there was a hub that was owned by the industry, a mobile money industry led hub, we do believe that that is the best model provided they can get it up and running. It is uh, not overtly complicated in getting, getting off, to, off the blocks. And there are a few initiatives like that right now. There is a, an industry scheme that has been launched by leading mobile operators, MTN and, and Orange called Mobali, which is short for Mobile Wallet Interoperability. These initiatives, if they, if they reach scale, would be the best ones for our stakeholders. But we don't know whether they are gonna be successful. We are working with our players, but uh, that, is, that would be our preferred model if everything went right. Um, now, let's see what some people say about my answer tomorrow, but that's my answer. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, given the uh, time frame, I'd like now to move to you to uh, wrap up the, the episode. I'd like to offer all the panelists maybe one minute uh, in terms of uh, wrap up and final comments. Uh, I'll start with Kevin. Kevin Butler. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk today. And uh, thanks to all of the panelists. Uh, I learned something during this uh, and I hope that uh, all of our attendees did as well. Uh, to echo uh, uh, Anand's uh, uh, points about uh, uh, interoperability, I think interoperability, resilience are uh, critical elements of the DFS ecosystem and 
uh, we can provide um, a general uh, guidance in terms of developing a framework. Uh, everybody's uh, situation is going to be individual and uh, every ecosystem looks a little different uh, from others. So uh, it is a longstanding challenge when we've got individually uh, developed uh, uh, solutions that are designed with a particular context in mind and trying to ensure that they interoperate with others that are built with different uh, design parameters and ensuring interoperability. But that is one of the great, uh, the great modern challenges and uh, the results, especially as we see now uh, with, uh, uh, with, with COVID and uh, the increased role that uh, digital transactions and digital payments are having, uh, having a, a, a seamless uh, experience for users and having the ability to interoperate with others is, is critical to our our future growth and development. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Mr. Khan. Thank you, Bilal. Um, I just wanted to end this by highlighting the fact that there is a broader set of ecosystem players in the DFS space, and that includes the post. Um, we are actively working to make sure that the governments recognize that because the posts in, in, in most of the cases are actually a part of the government and, and the provide a fantastic level of services, um, both social and financial to um, vulnerable populations and people who are in difficult circumstances. So as you would have seen from the India Post uh, presentation, um, the scalability, the reach, the accessibility, and the amount of solutions that the Post can provide is absolutely fantastic. Um, so we um, continue to make sure that we highlight these examples and we bring our stakeholders to the table and, and make sure that the policymakers are aware and able to leverage the postal sector players. And I invite all the participants to visit our page. Um, you'll find a link at the end of my presentation um, to see exactly what the posts are doing in terms of social and financial services in reaching out to these populations. And thank you very much to my colleagues at IT for organizing this and for having us on, on the panel. Thank you very much, Bilal. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Thank you for joining us from Bern today. And I'd like to uh, invite Mr. Singh for any final comments before we close. Thank you, Bilal. So, as I mentioned, uh, and I would uh, drop on what Mr. Khan, Mr. Khan was saying, that uh, the post can be a major player uh, in terms of uh, providing financial inclusion, especially digital financial inclusion, and in assisted mode, as we, uh, we, uh, we have just showed. Uh, and also, there is a, I mean, a huge potential for uh, having an interoperable uh, payment system, which is operated as public good, which can be accessed by multiple players. Uh, because as I mentioned, the cost of having a switch based and open loop systems can be prohibitive and within the if we can have such a system within regulatory framework, where multiple entities can come together and uh, break the silos. I mean, it will be, uh, uh, I mean, it, it can work wonders as it has done in the case of India, as I mentioned, I mean, the, something that would have that would have taken uh, around 47 years for us to achieve we have, I mean, India has done that in last uh, eight to nine years. So, uh, and uh, so again, I, I, I would say, I mean, uh, as I was saying in the, during the way forward, in my way forward slide, that there's a, uh, there's a requirement for various regulators to come together and build up, uh, build up on this uh, uh, further. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for all the uh, participants and all the uh, panelists here for giving. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like now to thank all the panelists and participants for joining today's webinar. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleagues at TSB, uh, VJ, Gifty, Arnold, and the whole team that uh, made uh, the preparations and made this uh, webinar series possible. We will be back in September uh, for more episodes. Uh, for the month of August, we will have a pre-recorded webinar on uh, tracking crypto Ponzi schemes. The information will be made available on the Insights DFS webinar website and on social media. With that, I'd like to thank you again uh, for your participation. Wish everyone a nice day or good night and declare this webinar closed. Thank you.